to the Complex Care Journal Club podcast. My name is Emily Goodwin. I'm a pediatrician in complex care at the Beacon Program at Children's Mercy Kansas City and your host for this episode. I am one of the course directors for this podcast series, where we seek to discuss emerging evidence in the care of children with medical complexity and its implications for practice. I am delighted to have Dr. Nancy Murphy from the University of Utah School of Medicine joining me today. She is the senior author of an article titled, High Parental Concern in Children with Medical Complexity, an Early Indicator of Illness, published in Hospital Pediatrics in February 2023. Dr. Murphy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. First, I would like to ask you to share a little bit about how your team developed this research project, if that's okay. I see that your group previously published information for designing home monitoring systems for children with medical complexity in 2019 in the International Journal of Medical Informatics, and then in Hospital Pediatrics in 2021 on the feasibility trial for this app, My Child CMC. I saw that the app allows parents to record their vital signs, temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, oximetry, but also symptoms, pain or seizures, intake, output, mental status, and oxygen use. What really struck me is it also allowed parents to rate their level of concern about their child's health. Taking a step back further, I'm wondering what you were seeing or your study team was seeing in practice or what led you to consider the use of an app that includes rating level of parental concern. Thank you for the opportunity to tell the big story. And I actually appreciate that framework because just talking about this paper doesn't really paint the whole picture. So this all came about in the late 17, 18, where we were really focusing hard on value-based care. The idea of children with medical complexity was coming up. We were starting to define the population. There was an increasing amount of technology that was available for kids to be at home. And then there was this big shift from you're cared for in the hospital to you're cared for at home and the responsibility on parents became bigger and bigger. And so we were trying to figure out how do we best support families at home? What do they need? How do they measure their progress? And how do they know when to reach out to their care team when they need help? I'm going to say that the perhaps arrogant assumption we made is that if parents called us when their kids were sick, we could divert them from coming to the emergency room, we could reduce hospitalizations, we could change courses of care. And perhaps in some levels, that's true. But really, what I think this is, is a study in parent-provider partnership. And how do we team up with families to really care for these kids across the continuum? So that's the background. Where'd we begin? We started out with, we want to start monitoring kids at home and not knowing how to do that, nor did we know whether parents were going to be willing to do it. We convened some focus groups and I'm going to say of all three of these papers, the funnest part of this project was the focus groups because I am always humbled by the simplicity of lessons that parents tell us that is so different than what we see when we're in our hospitals and clinics. So we asked parents, would you be interested in an app that helps you monitor your child's symptoms at home? And there was an overwhelming yes. Absolutely, we would like to do that. And then as the story evolved, the take was, well, we will gladly monitor our patient's symptoms at home. We kind of do it anyway. We have spiral bound notebooks and we have nurses and we have diaries and journals and sticky notes. But if you want to formalize this in an app, we will do it only if there's somebody on the receiving end of the app. And of course, we're like, ooh, hmm, that's a great ask. And I don't know if we can deliver on that quite up front. So that was one of our first challenges. And what we agreed to do was develop the content of the app and then figure out how to operationalize it later. But that was the biggest, strongest ask in the room so that parents could be connected with their familiar caregivers. Then as we developed the content of the app, this brings us now to our current paper, which is parental concern. There was concern from parents about reporting concern for fear that that might be misconstrued as I'm not confident or capable or comfortable in managing my child's care at home. So the response was, don't ask me about my concern. I want you to focus on my child. And so we kind of marginalized that piece of the initial effort. Then we did a feasibility trial. And the way we did that was we took kids with medical complexity to our standard definition, three organ systems evolved, tech dependencies, frequent hospitalizations, and we enrolled them during an acute care hospitalization. So we identified about 50 families, and then we randomized them to usual care, 
or 50 families who are going to participate in trying our drafted pilot app. And we did all the things that she mentioned, measuring vital signs. And we added this level. We took worry out and we changed it to level of concern. How concerned is that parent about their child's well-being today? And that other paper showed that it is feasible. Parents are able to do it. They are engaged with it. It is informative information. But the third paper and the one that we are here to discuss today is parental concern. And what does that tell us? And in that study, we dug in to see if parental concern could, in essence, be interpreted as a vital sign. When the parents are saying they're concerned, what are they really saying? And that's where we dug into the data a bit more to figure out what that means. Great. I love hearing that bigger picture of the story of how, how that was developed and also how your study team adapted based off the input and partnership with families in the development of this process. So what did your study team find? We found pretty much what we expected. When a parent calls and says, I am concerned, and some parents are able to say their sats are down, their oxygen is up, they're vomiting, their feeding is not tolerated, they're not sleeping, whatever it may be. Some parents are, are very clear in summarizing their objective assessments. Others, like something's wrong, it's not right. I And that gut feeling can still be misinterpreted by a busy clinician as a worried mom who just needs reassurances. But what we found was the level of parental concern absolutely was associated with four key findings. And those findings were, my child has increased pain, my child has an increased oxygen requirement, my child has decreased feeding tolerance or is taking less, and my child's mental status is different, irritable, fussy, lethargic, not their usual self. So parental concern is a big gestalt picture of something is wrong is a pretty reliable indicator in a child with medical complexity that something is wrong. I love that. I've really put some objective findings, like you said, to that spidey sense that parents have that something's wrong or they're not quite able to put their finger on it. So this is really innovative and I really appreciate you explaining that. You mentioned earlier that some challenges of using an app might include giving real-time feedback or um, responding to what's in there. Can you tell us about opportunities and challenges that you identified while developing and conducting your study? I would say our greatest challenge was getting our providers on board with what the parents were telling us, right? Oh, so much of our research is driven by the provider team, the research team, and less so by the parents. Our parents are the participants in the study. This wasn't really a study of the kids at all. And the parents were very clear about this app is not an app for us as much as it is an app for you you as the provider team and asking us to say if they're going to go through the exercise of taking their sticky notes and their journals and entering it into this app, which they'll gladly do, they want to make sure that there's somebody on the receiving end. Our minds immediately went to what? We need 24-hour telemetry? That's not what we're talking about. And so we came to some common ground. We asked parents to collect data on a daily basis. And they said, you know, if my kid is having a typical day, I'm going to collect data for three to five days. I think we landed on three. And I'm going to show you what a typical day looks like. Now, please don't ask me to record every single typical day because it's exactly the same as yesterday and it'll be the same tomorrow. Right. It made no sense. And they were right. And then they said, when we see that our kid is starting to change, we'll start recording more frequently. And that was a really clear moment to us that our parents know better than we do what is a typical day. And then we went on to have them start recording when their child was getting sick. And what we found is that one to three days prior to an acute illness, things were starting to look different, even in ways that may not be measurable, but they, they were different. And that gave us an opportunity to intervene. So parents tell us more than ever. They tell us what they need, what works, and have this sense of, I can manage it when my child is different until I reach a point at which I need help. And when I get to that point of needing help, I hope you guys are quick and available in helping us. What do you think are the implications for clinical practice? So specifically, what do you recommend for members of the interprofessional care team for children with medical complexity based off your findings? I would love to have this be a reminder to everybody on the care team that 
a parent of a child with medical complexity who calls with an increased level of concern that we stop and at a minimum ask some of those questions. They might not be giving us the objective data straight up, but if we ask them what's going on, what are the stats? Is he feeding? What is his mood, behavior, temperament, energy? Is your child in pain? And start to dig in a little bit. We can guide the parents in understanding what's going on with the kid. We can guide our clinicians in sorting out what may be happening and how we might be able to help from home. Were there any concerns for equity for access and use of this app, whether it be someone's digital health literacy or language barriers or barriers for time, as you mentioned, was a concern with it. Were there any other barriers like that with using this app? Our sample size was small, so we only had 25 people enrolled in this, and our demographic in the state of Utah is a bit homogeneous, and so we didn't get a real diverse sampling. We also did not have the resources to have a Spanish version of the app. That was pilot data. We have a lot more to learn. The families that were enrolled spoke English, had phones, and had the knowledge on how to navigate these apps fairly well. Our next step is to look at a multi-centered trial to get a bigger sampling of a more diverse population and families of a greater diversity of needs and resources to really understand how this is going to work. Nancy, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about your research team and how you put it together. I so enjoyed working with this group of providers and grant writing analytics, statistics, people who know how to interpret data so very well. Our app was part of a tech development project and is still being looked at in that tech sector. So I have to say that one of the strengths of our research team is the collaboration of lots of different brains and talents from our technology people to Dr. McCoy, who is a proficient and prolific grant writer. And then we had a hospitalist, and Xiaoming Cheng is a statistician analyst. So really putting together a group of people. I never would have met these people otherwise. We had to hunt each other out within the organization and get out of our own care team. So having the expertise of so many people was key. That's really a great message, too, for future researchers kind of thinking about not just within their own field, but reaching across different disciplines and, of course, partnering with families and research design. So essential. We had the focus group as our parent advisory panel to this study. And right now that is no longer in place. I think that's an essential piece to any of our research projects around families with children with medical complexity is to have a family advisor or two looking over our shoulders and reminding us to keep it real. Are there any other important next steps from your work or lessons learned that you'd like to share with researchers in the field or clinicians? An interesting thing that came up for us is that when families were saying, we're going to monitor our kids on this app and we want you to interpret it with us, they were saying, you, Dr. Goodwin, right? It says, you know my child. And we work hard to have a team-based system of care because Dr. Goodwin cannot be on call forever and ever. And so trying to build that parent-provider relationship where your trusted team will be involved in your child's care, but your trusted team may not always be your preferred provider or your primary provider. It's part of a team. And so that's an exercise in building trust. And I think that's where our systems of documentation and our electronic records and our access remotely is so critical so that as providers, we can call these families back and say, I reviewed Johnny's chart and I can see he is six years old with a diagnosis of and often has trouble with such and such. What's going on today to build that trust and keep that rapport going? So I saw in the discussion that you mentioned for next steps, the final iteration of the app may not include assessment of the parental concern. I was curious if you could say, what will help in making that decision? Parental concern is important. Just as it is for like, how worried are you if this kid is going to be medically fragile and this is going to escalate, we could frame it into what direction do you think this is heading and how fast do you think your child is changing? At this point, after our feasibility, our pilot and our qualitative assessments, however, I really think parents have come to trust their ability to say level of concern, not worry. 
I, I wouldn't use the word worry because that implies that you're emotionally wrapped up, but I am concerned. And I think that's something that we absolutely can continue in it. So what are the messages for patients and families from your study? I think there was a mutual aha, such as my provider is not always available. I think they forget when they call after hours that we are not in hospital. And so that was a reminder, I think, to them of the level of investment and commitment to their child's care that their care team offers and mutual respect. What we're doing is hard. What they are doing is crazy hard. And we're all trying to do this together. It seems, too, just from your data that you collected, that families should really trust that gut feeling when they have a concern and partner with the team. Absolutely. They should trust their gut feeling. And as providers, we should hear when they're saying their gut is twitching, something is happening. Anything else you'd like to share with listeners? I invite everyone to join in in this work. Our populations are unique. Our systems are unique. All of these conditions that glump into the world of children with medical complexity can really layer out very simply into a common set of symptoms and conditions that we manage regardless of the etiology. And so I would encourage our provider team, our broader community stakeholders and families to keep us broad in our thinking and bright-eyed in terms of the opportunities because there's so many. Thank you so much for your time, Nancy, and thank you to you and your team for advancing the field of complex care. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Complex Care Journal Club podcast. We aim to highlight research that has the potential to be practice changing, that values patient and family engagement, is relevant across disciplines and diagnoses, and uses high quality or novel research methods. We invite you to join the conversation by suggesting an article that you would like to see discussed in this podcast using the form provided on the Open Pediatrics YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us.